Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Gospel of John, chapter 1, uh, the first 14 verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Father again. I stand in your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the access that you've given us to, to come together and study your word. I just ask that you would filter out all of the foolishness and all of the ignorance, but seal to our hearts that which is truth, your truth, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. We've been studying together in the Epistle to the Romans, verse by verse, and we're getting close to the end of it. Now, in my last video, we had begun to look at verse 3 of chapter 15, Romans 15, verse 3. You'll remember again that we had 11 chapters of doctrine, and without an understanding of that doctrine, the rest of the Epistle doesn't make any sense. In the 12th chapter, we saw that God has ordained our steps. He's given us the life that we have, and we are to do all things without murmurings and disputing, realizing that it, it is God who works in us both the will and to do of his good pleasure. We got into the 14th chapter, and we looked at the areas of personal conviction. We live in a Christian world where more time is spent on personal convictions than on solid biblical doctrine. Discuss the deity and the majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, and a few people might show interest. Discuss the mode of water baptism, and you'll probably become Christian YouTube famous. Why people would be more interested in arguing about how you ought to be water baptized than the person in the work of Jesus Christ staggers my imagination, and yet personal convictions seem to be more important to Christians today than solid biblical doctrine. I trust that you will faithfully pursue the study of his word verse by verse. Every once in a while somebody says they disagree with me. Actually, they tend to say that a lot these days. You have every right to do that. We're studying these verses verse by verse. If that doesn't say what that to you, well, I mean, you figure out what it does say. It, it's God's Word, and I want you to honor His Word above everything in your life. You have the greatest privilege in the world, the greatest privilege to feast upon this book. There are multiplied millions of people that don't have that privilege and may lose it. So we ought to carry the infirmities of those who are weak. So let's get right back into the text. The word infirmity means an error due to some kind of mental difficulty. Usually it has to do with absence from a serious approach to the Word of God, and, and, and we're to bear with those, not merely endure them, but to carry them along. We, we must care about them. Those of us who are strong, is what the text says, and I don't want to class myself with the strong. The Holy Spirit does that. 
Paul, he classes Paul with the strong. We that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak. You have to decide where to put yourself there. The scriptures define the strong person for us, though. It's the one who eats meat, who esteems every day alike, who doesn't have any personal conviction that this thing or that thing is wrong. There's nothing unclean of itself. We just saw that in the 14th chapter. To him that esteems anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. And if he doubts and operates outside of faith, to him it is sin. And that's where we closed the 14th chapter. We're now told uh, those who are defined as strong are to bear the infirmities of the weak. And I believe the word infirmity infers a personal conviction that is based on error, not on the Word of God. That's what the word infirmity means. Let every one of us please his neighbor, the one nearest him, uh, for the good, and I pointed out in my last video that the word good is articulated, the good, to edification, to learning, to building up, which I've suggested is the Word of God. I believe it's articulated for specific identity. I believe the Holy Spirit is identifying the good as the truth of the Word of God. Our constant activity ought to be building people up in God's Word. For even Christ did not please himself. Now, that's an amazing phrase in that verse there. Jesus Christ is God of very God, and God cannot be separated from his word. And that's why I want you to spend time in it. Christ did not please himself. He was the one who spoke the worlds into existence. Yet he did not please himself. Now, I ask myself why the Holy Spirit would insert this phrase here. We have building people up in God's Word related to Christ, who is the Word, not pleasing Himself. So I have to read that as our involvement in the lives of others being related to both the truth of God's Word and our not pleasing ourselves, which to me means that any ministry absent of God's Word is self-pleasing and doesn't please God. But I also believe it's deeper than that. It's not I, but Christ which I hope to go on and show here. That's what pleases God, is our building people up in His Word. But how do we go about doing that, is the question. It was the living Word who took upon Himself the form of a servant to be made in the likeness of men and, and become obedient unto the death of the cross. It was the living Word that didn't please Himself. He came to do His Father's will for the joy that was set before Him, he, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross, despising the shame. The joy that was set before him could be defined as doing the will of his Father. I believe that that, that is absolutely correct. In fact, most commentaries will say that. But I believe there's a much deeper meaning in that. The joy that was set before him, folks, was you. The love that he had for you. He didn't please himself, but as it has been written, and this is a perfect passive, I've pointed this out from time to time. Every time you see this expression in the New Testament, it's a perfect passive in the Greek. As it has been completely written in past time with the consummate result that it stands eternally written. Look at the emphasis on the word. The perfect passive also says that the scriptures that you hold in your hand are all that God wants written. I personally believe that if Jesus Christ watched this video, he wouldn't leave a comment. Why? Because he's already said it all. As Jonah was three days in the fish's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days in the bowels of the earth. And I ain't going to waste time wondering how he survived that. Christ said it, and I believe it. This is God's word. It has been written in past time with a result that it stands eternally written. It's God's word, and it says that the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. We see here a claim, again, in the word of God, to the, or uh, a reference to the deity of Jesus Christ. He's not an offspring of God. He's not less than God. He's not another God. He's God of very God. When you reproach God... You reproach Christ. It falls on Christ. He's the brightness of the Almighty God. I mean, how do you separate the brightness of a light bulb from the light bulb? They are intrinsically the same. 
the reproaches of those that reproached thee fell on me. And the only way that they could fall on God was through the incarnation. It pleased God to become incarnate so that he might be our kinsman redeemer and bear the debt we owed, that, that we owed. And those reproaches fell on Christ. If you don't understand that, then you don't have peace as far as sin is concerned. If you're still back in the Romanist concept of unforgiven sin, you don't understand the finished work of Jesus Christ. He's forgiven you all trespasses, all sin. Now those are verses of Scripture. I didn't make that up. And I've said this before and I'll repeat it again. Your sins are not forgiven because you accept Christ because you believe, because you repent, because you confess, or anything else. Your sins are forgiven because Jesus Christ died in your place. It's that simple. And you're surrounded with a community that knows little of this book and asks you to do something in order that your sins be forgiven. Christ did it, and it's done. You have verses of Scripture that clearly declares He's forgiven you all trespasses, forgiven you all sin. But, but Steve, why do I then have to confess my sin where He's faithful and just to forgive my sin? The word confess there is homologeo. means to speak the same thing. It's saying that if we say the same thing God says about our sin, it's not naming sins. And what is that? You know, which is what? that He's forgiven us of all sin. We're in agreement with God on that, on that fact. The word forgive is a me, not charizomai, where we see all, all of our trespasses have been forgiven. It's a me, which means to move aside, has to do with fellowship. You know, big difference between those two words. You don't come to God naming all of those sins. You couldn't, you couldn't possibly do that anyway. Wallowing around in the garbage. You go to God and you confess. You say the same thing that He says about your sin. Praise God, my sin was laid on Christ. Praise God, He bore it all. That is 1 John 1, 9 confession. You stand before God without spot and without blemish. Now, I'm not making those word definitions up. Those are verses of Scripture by the blood of Christ to present us holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in His sight, Colossians 1. Did He do that or did He not? God's Word says tribulation works patience, and you say, well, Steve, it's, it's not working in my life. You know, the more tribulation I have, the less patience I have. I don't understand that verse. Folks, this is God's Word. Therefore, I believe tribulation worketh patience because, why? Because God said it does. Not because of anything that I see in my life. I believe that God is working in me to will and to do of His good pleasure, not because of anything that I see in my life, but because God said so. I believe that all things work together for my good, not because of anything I see in my life, but because God said so. I uh, attended a meeting once where the pastor said, Now, I want you all to go around and tell us how you know that you're saved. And, and people, you know, they came up with all kinds of things. And he got around to me, and I said, Because God said so. And they didn't like that. The only reason, folks, that I know that I'm God's child is because God said so. It isn't because I feel like it or because I've done anything, but because God said so. Things which have been written aforetime were written for our learning. Every single thing that was written before was written for our learning. All Scripture is given by inspiration, is profitable for reproof, for doctrine, for instruction in righteousness. And that, that includes more than just the Pauline epistles. Everything that God wrote before was for our learning, and I don't think that means we try and figure out why Ezra was struck dead touching the ark, like, you know, well, maybe he died because the Jews had figured out the potentials of uh, electrostatics, and they charged the ark with a tremendous voltage so that, you know, when he touched it, it killed him. Look, I, don't, I, don't, I didn't learn that when I read it. You know, it wasn't written for scientific dissection. Neither was it written to be a scientific textbook. It was written for our learning. 
I believe that should underlie every approach that you take. Why did God put this here for my learning? He didn't put it here so I'd try and figure out why Solomon was wise or why Samson was strong or how the plagues of Egypt happened scientifically like I watched on a television program here recently. He wrote it down for my learning about Christ. And if I don't spend any time in this book, how am I going to see Christ? Who is the Word? And if I don't spend any time in this book, how am I going to see who I am, my identity in Christ? And how are we going to help those who are weak? How are we going to preach the gospel? Whatever was written in past time was written for our learning in order that we, through the patience, the patience, it's articulated, and the comfort of the scriptures might have the hope. I get around uh, the, the web and I don't see a whole lot of patience and comfort and hope. Uh, I, I mean, I see people say that and then the grumbling starts and I, I think of the verse, you know, do all things without murmurings and complainings for it's God who is working in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. There is not a situation that ever touched your life that wasn't engineered by the sovereign God of the universe for your good in order that we, by means of the word, uh, translated through in the King James, that we, by means of the patience, the patience, Hupa Mane. Hupa Mane is the word. It's a tremendous word. It's a word that's almost impossible to to plumb all its depths, but I believe personally there's a nuance to that word that you ought to be aware of, and, and that is the word means to endure or, or to be patient in suffering and difficulty, to endure through it, but it's a word that, that has a particular meaning in Greek that I think is important in situations that you don't control. You know, it's one thing to talk about putting up with a situation that you do control, and then it's another thing to talk about a situation that you don't control. This is endurance in situations you don't control, because it's God who is working in you both the will and to do of his good pleasure. And when he has tested us, we shall come forth as gold. Numerous examples in Scripture where God's people endured a situation that God had placed them in, and the comfort... That's one who comes alongside to aid. Now, that, that word doesn't mean that if you hold a Bible in your hand or carry it in your, your purse or your saddlebag, that it's a comforter. The word has to imply a knowledge of the scriptures. It's the scriptures that are there for comfort and encouragement, not just a, a physical book. The, in, the endurance, the comfort, and the hope are all articulated. They are all specific, meaning that they are based upon the knowledge of the word. The purpose being that we might have the hope. That's a very specific hope. It's not wishful thinking. Christian hope is absolutely unique. Uh, human hope says, well, I hope it don't rain. I hope it doesn't snow. Or I hope, you know, I, I get a raise. Or, or I hope my horse don't throw me. Or I hope this or I hope that. But that's not the defin definite you know, absolute, uh, guaranteed hope of Scripture. It's, it's just, when God speaks, it's absolutely certain. We don't have a nebulous hope. We have a certain hope. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. We have a certain hope. And we know that from the Scriptures, without any knowledge of the scripture there can't be patient endurance there can't be uh, the comfort there can't be the hope for even christ pleased not himself but as it is written the reproaches of them that reproached you fell on me i don't see this as much of uh, as our being willing to suffer reproach and contempt in order to do the good which i i believe is truth to our neighbor though we should be willing, rather I see it as the result of our teaching the good, which I believe to be the truth. Truth will do that. I mean, you can trust God concerning that. And that the contempt of Jesus Christ is contempt of him who appointed him. That the enemies of God vented their fury on Christ proves that Christ was bent on pleasing, not himself. Otherwise, 
he would have abstained from taking these sufferings upon himself. And he did, th he did this, folks, in view of the salvation of us, you and I, and of, en of enjoying, with the view of enjoying our company with him in glory throughout eternity. He did it because he loved us, and millions and upon millions are not even sure God loves them, which is a result of their not knowing him. You need to understand that we can be redeemed freely by God's grace and not know Him experientially. Gnosko, not oida, perfect knowledge, but gnosko, experiential knowledge. We read that in, in Philippians, that I may know, that's gnosko, Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings, being made conformable unto His death. Okay? If by any means I might, that's a, that's a subjunctive there, subjunctive mood, maybe I will, maybe I won't, attain unto the out-resurrection from the dead. That's, that's a different word there also. The, the word for that, that out-resurrection is not the same word used for Christ's resurrection. It's only used once in Scripture. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which I also am apprehended of Christ Jesus, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, that's our former unrenewed state of mind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before. Note that there's no mention of even the present because we walk by faith, not by sight. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Folks, that's our high calling. God refers to this as our high calling, and many Christians believe that their high calling, you know, is to be the best Christian they can be, or, you know, or, you know to be associated with themselves and what they must do, rather than on what Christ and what He did, where th that there is no fellowship of His sufferings, no being made conformable unto his death, no out resurrection from the dead. That's where we are knowing that we're raised with Christ and we walk in newness of life. And as I mentioned, that's the only occurrence in all of Scripture of that word out resurrection. Colossians 3, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. So that's how we know him. In the experiential sense, in newness of life, to walk in, in resurrection life, newness of life, his life which springs out of his own resurrection. That's why it's the word out of, out resurrection. That, that intimately connects our resurrection life to the very life of Christ himself and his resurrection. That's how we know him in the sense that Paul expressly desired, a desire that I believe God fulfilled in his life. And I believe that there was a reason why the Holy Spirit had Paul express uncertainty as to him having attained it, because God wanted for our benefit to emphasize the word desire. My dear friends, the Christian life is not about us at all. It's about Christ. The world religious system has today, to a great extent, become separated from Christ. And, and, and just why is that? Because it hasn't become separated from self. And just as you can't separate the brightness of the bulb from the bulb, you can't separate the Word of God from the living God, Jesus Christ. He's magnified His Word above all His name. Don't miss the privilege of making the Word of God an, an inseparable part of your life while there's still time. I love you all. I truly do. Till next time, thanks for watching.